we're going to go ahead and get started, although I realize a few other folks will be joining us. Um, we're extremely thrilled to have Joanne Wilson here. Melissa Williamson, our Structure Discovery Coordinator, will introduce Joanne, but um, I think you're going to find that she's extremely knowledgeable. And we feel that it's a real coup to have her here, especially on such short notice. For those of you who don't know, I'm Jessica Agneson. I'm the regional director here. And uh, my staff and um, Carol's staff, um, we, we do a lot together. And so even though we're a little bit cozy today, <laughs> I, like cozy. I think that um, it will make for a very productive and interactive day and we look forward to your feedback i think joanne will feel um, um that we're encouraging as many questions and conversation as possible so thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here again joanne thank you as well and melissa if you will would you please um, oh, and I do have agendas for anyone who wants. It's, it's quite simple for the day. Um, 8.30 to 11.30, we will um, um, be learning a course about structured discovery. For those of you who do not know, restrooms are about, uh, if you go to the glass partition, basically, where my office is, they're straight ahead. Uh, we have additional restrooms um, in the hallway, so before you get to the glass partition, if you take a left and then take a right, the men's room and then the ladies' room is down that narrow hallway. So, um, for those of you who I might not have gotten your lunch order, I'll come around and get uh, lunch. Joanne will dictate, of course, when we have breaks, etc. Um, and um, now, without further, <laughs> oh, wait, wait, no, I'm teasing. <laughs> now, Melissa, if you will please do me the honor of introducing Joanne. I have to add my own appreciation for all of your coming. We are in tight quarters, and we realize that, and um, it's good that we all like each other, right? <laughs> Hopefully we'll all like each other at the end of the day. Um, we really are very lucky to have Joanne Wilson with us. Joanne founded the Louisiana Center for the Blind in 1985. That's right. Which makes me feel very old. Um, and me too. And it makes her old. It just makes me feel old. Um, Joanne also served as the Commissioner of Rehabilitation, the Rehabilitation Services Administration under George W. Bush. She was appointed by George W. Bush. And that, as all of you know, is a big deal. So to have somebody with her credentials here to teach us is very exciting. In addition, on a personal note, Joanne has been a longtime mentor of mine. I worked for her, God bless her soul. Um, <laughs> for a brief period of time and trained under her in terms of structured discovery. And I'm blessed to call her friend. And I hope that you enjoy your working with her today, your time with her. And I personally look forward to gaining more knowledge from her. So enjoy your time with Joanne and please make the most of it. Okay. Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. Am I ready to go? Okay. Um, thank you, Melissa, and thank you, Jessica. Um, I, I really am glad to be here. One of my most favorite things in the whole world is to talk about training blind people in methods with methods and technologies that really work for them. And so I am so proud that you guys are trying this space to do this program and that all the rest of you are going to be a part of, of our, whole, um, our whole big project here. You know, to do the best we can for blind people. Now, just to start out, I would like you each to introduce yourselves very briefly. You know, who you are, what you do um, for the agency. But the most important part of what I want to hear from you guys today is why you work here in the rehabilitation field. Why are you here? You know, what's, 
why, why are you doing your job and not something else? Okay, that's the real part I want to hear from you. So let's start on my left over here. He's the first person. Me. Hello. 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 Hello low vision and mobility problem, but I am a social worker and I'm a social worker because I want to make a difference. And I'm here because I got placed, but I can't imagine ever going back. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm Carol Pinkard. I'm a field supervisor with ADRS uh, serving client services division for Jefferson and surrounding counties. And I'm in this field because I enjoy the challenge of it. Um, I think that it is challenging, but it's also rewarding and offers different opportunities and different experiences for people. So I enjoy what I do. Uh, Jeremy Ward, Orientation Mobility Specialist from Tuscaloosa. I enjoy the one on one interaction. I probably prefer that more than a group setting, um, personally, um, and the tangible results you see uh, from working with people. Uh, they didn't even know that, that that I was on the ballot. Uh, they were one of the Wall Street Journal calls and said, who won that election down there? Uh, the AP reported that the congressman, the incumbent congressman lost, but they didn't report my name. And the Republican uh, congressional committee didn't have my name. They couldn't even tell the Wall Street Journal who, who was the candidate. So I came into Washington as a complete outsider uh, and, and you know, joined a group of guys, and we, we shook up uh, Washington, D.C. You know, Congress would be controlled by the Democrats for 36 years when I uh, came to Congress, and within four years, Republicans took control. We we kicked out the Speaker of the House and put the Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee in jail because we unearthed scandals that actually cost Republicans and Democrats their seat. Uh, but it showed that there was at least some group of folks who wanted to stand up and fight for the American people. And that's how I was able to get elected in a 60% and a 70% Democratic district and won the state of Pennsylvania a couple of times. Because I went out there and fought uh, as an outsider and cleaned up on what was going on with term limits and the Republican caucus uh, in the United States Senate. So we, we have a strong record of being an outsider who understands how to play the inside game and get things done. And, you know, Carly Fiorini the other day said, you know, these the people are swimming in this fish tank. They don't even know, you know how, how toxic it is. I know how toxic it is. And I can survive in that fish tank. A lot of folks are going to think they can jump into that tank. And they don't know where the sharks are. They don't know where, you know, where the piranhas are going to come out and try to get you. I do. And that's why we need someone who has an out, who has a proven outsider record and the ability to get things done in Washington. We're talking with Senator Rick uh, Santorum. And, Senator, I'd like to ask you a few questions about the, the state of the race. Uh, both yep. Rick Perry and Scott Walker uh, have now fallen by the wayside with Walker's announcement yesterday. Is, is that surprising to you? Uh, actually, it is. I mean, I, I don't know Scott very well, but I know Rick very well. And I have a lot of respect for Rick Perry and, and, uh, and his uh, his contributions to, uh, uh, to really the conservative movement in the state of Texas. Uh, you know, I, I will tell you, I mean, it's surprising only because the fact that this race, it's, a, it's just so hard to raise dollars. It's hard to raise uh, money to run your campaign. I mean, that's what I talked to Rick uh, extensively after he dropped out. And he just said, you know, the small dollar contribution. Uh, that keep a campaign, not a super PAC, but a campaign running, are just harder and harder to get. People are sitting on, on their money and, and not making a decision who to support. They're sort of waiting for the field to uh, to sort out. And by doing so, they're sorting the field out uh, because folks who are not high in the polls, and of course people who are high in the polls, are the people the national media is paying attention to. So in a sense, what's happening is people don't contribute to candidates. Uh, and what they're doing is giving more power to the, to the national media to determine who our candidate is. And that's the dangerous thing that we've seen both from uh, both Scott Walker's uh, removal from the off from, uh, from this and particularly Rick Perry. So as a result, of course, you're going to hear me, John, make a call, go to RickSantone.com and make a contribution. So uh, if, if you want to you keep people in the race, and you, and you, then you have to step up and, and say, you know, this is an important voice that we have to have out there. And we're not going to let the media determine who our candidate is by paying all the attention to two or three candidates. 
So, Senator, it sounds like you're confirming what I've always assumed to be true, which is that when candidates drop out early, it's just about always about money. E either their big donors uh, are not satisfied with their standing in the polls and, and the big donors dry up or, or the grassroots contributions are, are not coming in. And that and it sounds like you're saying, yeah, that's right. Basically, people drop out because they run out of money. Well, and that's that's I realized that you know four years ago we were going to be in a uh, on a tight budget. Uh, I always say I run my campaigns like I'm going to run the federal government. We run it very lean, very mean, and uh, and I can survive in an environment that's a, uh, is a sort of a low low oxygen environment. I can I can survive uh, because we do run a very grassroots volunteer based organization. Uh, we probably have a, you know, a fraction of the staff that most of the other campaigns have. But we have volunteers that fill in because we have folks who are very passionate about, about what I've been able to accomplish and what, what our vision is for the future of our country. And, and, you know, people can spend time out on the campaign. They can go around and, and spend other time in the cities raising money. And if you look uh, at the candidates and, and their appearances and how many times they're out of the crowds and the meeting and doing town hall meetings, you'll get a sense as to whether they're a candidate that's going to rely on money or candidates that's going to rely on grassroots and, 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 uh, and, and organizations. And you know we're not going to we're not going to show a lot of money uh, being raised, but we're raising enough money to support the campaign that we're running, which is a campaign that's focused on Rick Santorum being in Des Moines today doing five town hall meetings and a bunch of radio shows here in town and, and the like. That's the difference. I'm not in Los Angeles raising money. I'm not in New York raising money. Why? Because I'd rather spend my time here getting votes than spend my time beholding the donors so I can raise money to get their votes. That's the that's the two ways I look at it. One of the things that a lot of candidates spend a lot of money on is consultants. And on the Republican side, consultants have been taking a lot of heat. There's a lot of grassroots folks who say those blasted consultants, the main thing they do is lead our candidates astray. Do you Amen. use consultants? I mean, do, you, do you agree with that? None. Never. I've never, I've never hired a consultant uh, to, uh, to do strategy or manage, or manage my campaign or, or, uh, or, or tell me you know, what to do and what to think. Uh, I, Never in any of my campaigns, I've never done that. Uh, I don't hire pollsters. Uh, you know, my poll is going out and doing town hall meetings uh, every single day. That's how I get a sense of what's what, what, what the American public can say. I did a you know an hour uh, over an hour and fifteen minute town hall meeting last night in, in Fulton County, in Indianola, uh, Iowa, and you know we told me to talk about real grassroots, great discussion, back and forth. That's that's where you sort of get the pulse of what's going on in America. People say, well, how did you win 11 states against Mitt Romney? Because he has spent you four or five to one. I said, because I I understood what, what what was going on out there in America. I wasn't hanging out with the donor class, raising money, raising all this money, so I could go in and, and have the media say, oh, well, he's the best candidate because he's raised the most money. Unfortunately, this there's a, there's a racket that goes on. If you and, and one of the reasons a lot of folks still just raise money is because the media will say, oh, well, they're the strongest candidate because they're raising money. We have a candidate that's racing. Nominate me because I'm the conservative that can raise money. Really? I mean, is, it, is that why you should be nominated because you spend all your time raising money as opposed to spending all your time talking to voters? Is that what you really want to tell conservatives? That you need to, you need to uh, support the guy who's tied in with the money people? I don't think so. I think you want to support the guy who's not tied in with the money people. Senator, let me ask you about a, a particular issue. You've always been strong on social issues throughout your career. Are the Planned Parenthood videos having an impact? Are you, are you seeing concern among voters that that issue is really being elevated? It, there's no question that uh, from four years ago when I ran to this time, that the life issue is much, much higher. And, and, and just the passion when you just mentioned Planned Parenthood, and this is... Uh, I went through, uh, back in, uh, in the late 90s, early part of 2000, uh, trying to pass a bill to ban partial birth abortions. And, uh, you know, Planned Parenthood is was engaged in partial birth abortion. So I know the impact of that, that discussion of delivering a child that would otherwise be born alive uh, and, and killing that child as, as, as most of the child is outside the mother and being held in the hand of the doctor. That's one thing to describe. It's another thing to actually see it, actually actually hear the medical professionals talk about it. This is this is graphic. It's, it's, it's very difficult to listen to and watch, but it sears an impression on the mind as to what abortion really is. And that changed the attitude of abortion 20 years ago. Abortion, for the first time, uh, people began to, to move to the pro-life side. I think you're seeing that uh, in, in, uh, as a result of these videos, but you're also seeing the pro-life movement itself, people who are pro-life 
much more engaged in, in this battle, and I think that's going to be a good thing for, for the country. Dr. Ben Carson made a lot of waves the other day by saying that he would uh, would not advocate having a Muslim as uh, president. He later backed off that arguably a little bit. Uh, what's your view on that? Do you agree with that sentiment or not? Here's, here's you know, I, I think there's been a lot of confusion, and, and this is what just really ticks me off. I mean, we have, uh, we have, uh, we have needed income going down in America. We have uh, we're, on the, we're on the verge of giving uh, Iran a, uh, a ticket to a nuclear a, a nuclear device. Uh, we have uh, all sorts of things. Uh, we have now Prime Minister of Israel meeting with uh, with with Putin because uh, the United States isn't a, isn't a strong enough ally, and so we, 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 the, the Israel has to start looking uh, for other places for support. I mean, we have all these problems, and what does the national media want to focus on? Uh, you know, some hypothetical question to try to get gotcha uh, to uh, to Ben Carson and. Uh, and I said this the other day when they tried to do the same thing to Donald Trump on the Muslim issue, which is, you know, I'm not going to defend Barack Obama when some questioner questions whether he's a Christian. The, the media does a terrific job already defending Barack Obama, defending the left, defending Hillary Clinton, and, and it shouldn't be the, uh, the obligation of Republicans to weigh into these gotcha hypothetical questions. Uh, you know, when, when I first heard it, it was reported to me, it, it, it sounded to me like Ben Carson was saying a Muslim can't be president, which, of course is against the Sixth Amendment for the, uh, uh, Article 6 of the Constitution. That that obviously is not what he was saying. And and so I, I think let's dispel that. What Ben Carson was saying is he wouldn't vote for, for a Muslim because uh, a, a Muslim who is a strict adherent to Sharia law, and Sharia law, and I've said this multiple times, Sharia law is incompatible with the United States, the United States Constitution. They are, they are two different... Versions. Here's what people don't understand about Islam. Islam is a political doctrine, not just a religious doctrine. And so uh, there is no separation of church and state in Islam. And so that's what Ben was talking about. It's just a basic understanding that Islam is both a political and religious doctrine. And if someone adheres to both, then that, that would be antithetical for, for me as a person to vote for someone who has a uh, a, a worldview that is uh, against the Constitution. Having said that, if someone doesn't have that point of view, and many Muslims in America are secular or, or don't uh, uh, adhere to political Islam like they do a, a, in the Middle East, so that's a different story. And that's just a common sense approach. If someone has a, a point of view that is different than what, uh, what, what our beliefs are in this country, is, uh, in our Constitution, and rejects our Constitution, of course, uh, you shouldn't vote for this question. Senator Rick Santorum, I, I want to ask you just one more uh, question before we let you go. And, and as you mentioned, the press obviously is always eager to jump on any controversy that comes up on the Republican side of the, legis of the ledger, but they're very slow to talk about what's happening on the Democratic side. And it seems to me that the <clears throat> Democrats are terrible. It's getting worse. That's, that's what I understand. I mean, it's just getting worse and worse. And the more Republican candidates they have, and the more they, they see an opportunity to play gotcha, uh, and, and I just think we have to stop. We, and, and they just, you know, we have to say to the press, like I said the other day, it's just cut it out. And I'm, I'm just, don't answer these ridiculous questions. Well, let me ask you, Senator, what you think about the Democratic side of the, of the ledger, because I think they're in deep trouble. Uh, is Hillary uh, finished? She's, she's sinking like a stone in the polls. Uh, can Bernie Sanders, an avowed socialist, possibly be a serious uh, candidate for president? They're talking about Joe Biden getting in. I mean, we've seen Joe yeah, as a... Like this from, yeah, I, I mean, Joe what do you Biden think about is it? sort of a, a, a running joke uh, in, the, in the national media. I mean, you talk about uh, someone who, who who habitually puts their foot in their mouth and and uh, has had policies that are that historically have just been completely wrong, uh, and, and particularly in foreign policy. Uh, to even think about him as a viable alternative uh, is... Is, it tells you how weak the Democratic field is. So uh, I always say to folks when they're looking at the Republican nomination, get very serious about making sure that you nominate someone uh, who, can, uh, who can go to Washington, D.C. as an outsider, get things done, and has an understanding of how to, how to make things happen because and there's a pretty high likelihood that the Republican nominee is going to be the President of the United States given the Democratic field right now. Senator Rick Santorum, thank you so much for being with us on the Laura Ingram Show. John, thanks so much. And as I said to folks, uh, uh, let's we keep the uh, keep the gas in the tank. If you go to rickdayatorm.com and, and send us a contribution, I'd appreciate it very much. We're going to take a break now, and when we come back, 
I will be joined uh, in studio by my longtime uh, writing partner and partner on the Powerline website, uh, Scott Johnson. The Laura Ingram Show. The holidays will be here before we know it. So you have to get your home ready for those special gatherings of family and friends. You know, part of the team isn't holding up their end of it. Then we don't have the kind of program that we need to have here in Alabama and the good kind of services we have. I want to tell you the story about Paul. Paul was one of the first students that came to the Louisiana Center for the Blind. And he was a pain in the behind, I will tell you, okay? <laughs> he was not the easiest student in the world, okay? Um, Paul had come to us and run away from Texas because they were going to put him in a home for, he had graduated, gotten out of high school, and they were going to put him in a home for mentally retarded people, okay? And he didn't want that, so he ran away, and he ran to Louisiana to live with his, his grandmother, you know, knowing that there could be something better for him. Well, somehow he ended up at the Louisiana Center for the Blind, and he drove us crazy, okay? I mean, he, the guy would never, he was running everywhere he went, and he couldn't see, okay? And he was barely using a cane, and we were terrified he was going to run out and get killed out in the streets because he, he wouldn't stop and listen. He would just run, okay? He'd go into the home ec kitchen, and I went in there one day, and he had jalapenos in the Kool-Aid, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and his cane had a spoon right in the middle of it, and I mean, he was just driving us crazy, okay? But we got Paul through the program. And when he finished, he got a job working in with a chef, a nearby chef, a friend of ours, like a guy that believed in blind people. And he hired Paul, of all things, to chop up vegetables and to work in his kitchens and, and to help him. Okay, and so one day um, we had a, a visitor coming um, to our center to see how we did things, what we were all about, because she was getting ready to start a program in Colorado, and she, she wanted to see what we did. And, and that day, we had a, to go to a banquet, and the banquet was being served, so I invited her to go with us, and the banquet was being served by the chef that had hired Paul. So we get there, and sure enough, Paul is there helping the chef during the- Maintain their independence and live alone. But living alone comes with risk. What if you suddenly became ill, got injured, or fell, and were unable to reach a phone? The answer is a small pendant from Alert USA. This two-way personal emergency response system is meant for those times when help is needed, but the phone is out of reach. The wearer simply presses the pendant, alerting our monitoring station, who then summons help to your residence. Right now, for a limited time, get the Alert USA system for just 50 cents a day. This little pendant was a lifesaver. For a free brochure, call 1-800-832-1177. That's 1-800-832-1177. Act now and receive a smoke detector with free 24-hour monitoring when you subscribe. Call 1-800-832-1177. If you're one of the 40 million without health insurance and are worried about health care, then you should know about Qualified Health. Qualified Health is a nationwide non-insurance medical savings. I came here one day and said, you know, I know you only have a few more weeks here, but I would like you to build one more house. And the carpenter reluctantly said, okay, and without too much enthusiasm, went to work and started putting together this house, okay? And he was kind of a little burned out, like I said, so he wasn't using his finest master skills. He was just kind of putting together the house a little sloppily, but throwing it together. Not necessarily using the finest material, but whatever he could find around. Because after all, he was getting retired and this was his last house. When he got finished with the house, he went back to the his boss and he handed the keys to, to this new house, the boss. The boss turned around and gave the carpenter back the keys and said, for all your loyal service and all your work, I'm giving you this house. And the carpenter thought, Oh, <laughs> if I would have known that was going to be my house, maybe I would have put a little bit more of my master skills into it. I would have used better material. Maybe this house would have come out a little differently. So I tell you this story because 
what we're here in this room today to talk about is how to build programs that we would want to be a part of, that we would want our children, our family members, our best friends to go to. We want to get the best services we can ever make, not just slide by and pull our paychecks in, do a little bit of dabble, a little bit here. We want to do the best. We want to build a system that we would want to serve us or to serve someone that we love. We want to get the best system there ever was. Okay, so I want to start out a little bit today. I heard a little about you, not much. If we had more time, I would like to hear more, okay? But I want to tell you a little bit about my story. And you think, oh, boy, do we really want to hear her story, okay? I'm going to tell you my story, not because it's anything particularly interesting or amazing or different. Reverse is true. My story is everybody's story, okay? Lots of you blind people in this room, even in your introductions, I picked up. I thought, oh, she's going to identify with my story. He's going to identify with my story, okay? You, you folks that have disabilities will definitely identify with some of these things. The details will change. The feelings will be the same, okay? You that don't have disabilities, I want you for a little bit to climb into the body, into the mind of the people that you work with. I want to share with you how blind people think and feel and what happens to us as we go through our lives. So don't just listen to my details. Think about it, how you're going to apply it to the folks that you work with. Okay, one of my very earliest memories was when I was three years old. And I was playing in the living room of our little apartment, and I got up, and I was running into another room, and I tripped over my little cousin that was playing in the doorway. And I started crying, and my uncle and my mother picked me up, and they were patting me on the back, and they said, poor Joanne, she tripped and fell because she couldn't see. She didn't see. She's losing her eyesight. She's going blind. And I had no idea what that meant. I was only three years old, okay? But I felt the pity in their voices. And I kept thinking, I'm okay. I just felt bad because they felt bad. But I didn't know why. I was only three years old. I remember when I was nine years old, I was sitting in church one day, and the priest got up like he did every Sunday, and he said, oh, the Smiths had a baby boy, and the Joneses had a baby girl, and then he came to the Woods family, the blind couple in our church, and he said, the Woods family had this healthy baby girl, and he went on and on about how wonderful it was, and I sat there in just wiggled in my seat and just felt so weird. And I thought, why is he making such a big deal just because they're blind? You know, I, I was only nine years old and I didn't have words to express my feelings, but I knew what they were doing wasn't right. And I, and I just felt bad for them. And I thought, why? Why the amazing deal? Like, like Melissa said earlier, why are they so amazing mm -hmm. just because they're blind? But I didn't have words to say it. I remember when we went, my family and I went up to Rochester, Minnesota, to the Mayo Clinic to finally figure out what the heck was going on with my eyes, their eyesight at RP, and they're getting worse and worse. And we came out of that doctor's visit, and we got in the car, and it was the first time almost the only time that I'd ever seen my father cry. And that, I knew, was the moment when he was told that I was going to go totally blind. And there was silence and gloom in that car and sadness, but nobody talked about it. Nobody said anything to me. I thought something awful is going to happen, and there's nothing I can do about it. And I don't even know exactly what it is. But it's got to be something really, really bad. I remember as a teenager, 
you know, I by then I kind of had the lingo down, and I could I could say, oh yes, I'm going to go to college, and I'm going to be a teacher, and I'm going to get married and have children, and I'm going to live the American dream. But alone in bed at night, I would often cry myself to sleep, thinking, how the heck am I really going to do this? You know, how am I going to do it? The desperation you guys talked about that our consumers have. How am I really going to do it? I couldn't believe. How could I do it? So surrounding me, I began to feel the pity, the sadness, the low expectations, the embarrassment. I spent so much of my time not talking about blindness and faking sight and pretending that everything was okay. And I bet you some of you guys in, your, in this room have done this. <laughs> faking sight and pretending everything mm -hmm. is just okay. Just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but inside, you go around all wadded up, you know, and the pressure's there and you're all wadded up wondering, what's really going to happen to me? And that little worry is always hanging in the back of your mind. That's how many of your consumers feel. That's why they come to us. Okay, so then one day, I was walking home from um, a junior college class, and I came to my house, and I could see a little then, and I saw the state car sitting out in front of my house, and on it said, the Iowa Commission for the Blind. And I thought, oh, there's somebody there from some blind agency there. <laughs> oh. And I just walked around the block. I just kept walking around the block until that console left. Okay? I was not going to hang around some blind agency person and just walk around the block. I didn't want anything to do with them. Well, eventually, my counselor, his name is Don Bell. 50 years later, I still remember Don. And I want to tell you about Don, okay? And I want to tell you some of the things that he did for me. And maybe there's some ideas that you'll get on how to work with your consumers from this. Because Don Bell changed my life. Okay, so he eventually found me at home. And I, he sat me down in my living room. And one of the first things he said was he said, Joanne, are you blind? And he used the big B word, blind. <laughs> and I said, no, no, I just can't see very well. And he held up a newspaper. And he said, can you read this newspaper? And I said, well, I can sort of see the headline a little. And he said, Joanne, you're blind. And I thought he was the meanest thing <laughs> I'd ever known. He was horrible. He was mean. He was saying that word that I've been avoiding for so long because who wants to be a weird old blind person? Who wants to be one of those crazy, dysfunctional, unemployable, not normal people? I'm not blind. I don't want to be there. But he's kept using that word. He used it with such ease. And I thought, what? Why is he so comfortable with that? So then he started talking to me about going down to a seminar that the agency was running for um, blind college students. I thought, oh yeah, right. I'm going to go down and hang around these horrible blind people. I'm not one of them. I don't want to go hang around them. Well, he kept pushing me and pushing me and pushing me, and he, you know, eventually I said, okay, all right, all right, I'll go to this seminar. Hope nobody sees me there. I'll just kind of go. Well, I went to that seminar, and it was probably one of the wisest things that my counselor did for me. He got me around other blind people, and I looked at those other college students, and I thought, now, wait a minute. You know, they're, they're doing stuff that I was only kind of hoping I could do. You know, they're... They're walking freely places. They're able to read their agendas and braille. They're, the most important thing was that they, they were happy. They weren't wadded up inside and they were free. They were free and they were using the word blind and they were, they were acting normal. And, and, and I thought, they weren't going around this gun 
cheap little worry in the back of their head all the time. They had some sort of freedom that I wanted. Okay. So that evening, we went off to this fancy restaurant. You know, they want to take wine guys to this fancy restaurant. I never I grew up in this little town in Iowa. No, I haven't been to some big fancy old restaurant, you know? So I went to that restaurant. And the meal got finished, and I thought, oh, no, I've got to figure out how to pay for this thing. So I'm bending over the candle in the middle of the table, trying to read my money. Almost caught my hair on fire. Oh, okay, I'm trying to read this thing. And my cousin came up and took me on the shoulder, and he said, Joanne, let me show you. You don't have to pay for this meal. This meal's free, but let me show you how to fold your money so that you can tell next time what's what. So he gave me this little quick two-minute <clears throat> lesson on how to fold my money. He gave me a little bit more independence, little things that make us really free. So then it was time to walk back to this building, and by then it was dark outside, and RP people, you can't see at night. And I thought, oh, crap, how am I going to get back there, you know, without killing myself? And I thought, I'll hang on to my rehab console. Don. No. <laughs> Don said, Joanne, why don't you come and hang on to Ramona here? And um, she'll help you get back. Well, Ramona turned out to be this totally blind other college student. <laughs> and I thought, what the heck? I'm going to entrust my life to this totally blind woman. I'm going to hang on to her, and she's going to get me back to the building. So I'm walking along, and I'm thinking, um, maybe there's something wrong with this picture, you know? I, the person that wasn't blind, that didn't need skills, would never touch a cane, is having a totally blind woman use her cane confidently and safely getting me back to the building. Maybe there's something to this stuff and maybe I ought to look at it. And I thought, that eh, darn Don Bell, my counselor, he knew exactly what he was doing. <laughs> you know, he knew what he was doing knocked me in the head. So Don, you know, um, eventually talked me into going into training. And so I went to probably the first, well, it was the first structured discovery training program in this country. It was started in the 19, about 1958 when a guy named Kenneth Jernigan, a blind man, took over the Iowa Commission for the Blind. At that point, it was the worst agency in this country. When they created it in rehab, it was the worst agency in the country. And he took it over and he said, okay, we are gonna prove that we can build, we can build a house that we wanna live in, okay? <laughs> that we can build a good house. Okay, that we can build a good agency. And one of the things he did in that agency um, was to start the first structured discovery training program for blind people. And so Don, my counselor, pushed and talked me into going into the program. So I went into that program, and I had many, many experiences there. I learned skills, okay? Believe me, I fought using that darn cane, and I fought using sleeve shades, and I, you know, didn't want to learn real, but, but I, I learned the skills, okay? But more importantly, they drilled down in me and said, why do you have these feelings, Joanne? And help me analyze why blind people have these universal feelings about blindness. And, and help change my attitude. And help give me a new way of looking at blindness. <clears throat> so they gave me skills. They gave me a new attitude. They showed me why the public treated me the way they did. Why other people out there help shape me as a blind person for the better or for the worse? Okay, and how to deal with the public's reactions about blindness. Taught me how to give back. They taught me how to blend in. Okay, so I went to that training center. Well, I was at that training center. We had to read a lot of stuff and talk about it. But I noticed that my counselor, Don Bell, was reading the same stuff. I was shocked. Wait a minute. He doesn't have to sit and read this stuff. They're making me read it. Why is he reading it? Mm -hmm. I would go hang around other blind people, and I noticed that my counselor, Don Bell, was there also hanging around blind people at social events, not just professional little meetings in his office, but at social events. 
You know, I went off to conventions of blind people. And my God, I looked around and there was Don Bell at these conventions of the blind. You know, meeting and hanging and talking and finding out what the heck were some of the, the issues that blind people dealt with and the struggles and socializing and listening to the, you know, the real issues that blind people face. He was learning that too. My counselor, um, after my training, came to me and he said, Joanne, what, what, or well, my, I guess I was still in my training. He said, what do you want to become? What do you want to do when you leave here? I said, well, I want to go back to college and I want to be a teacher. Teach, you know, sighted kids, regular classroom. And he, Don didn't bother to tell me that there'd never been a blind teacher in the state of Iowa before teaching in the public schools. Yeah, there'd been a few blind teachers teaching at the school for blind, but not out in the public schools. He didn't bother to tell me that. Instead, you know what he did? He went and found some other blind teachers that were teaching in public schools out in California. And he had me talk to those folks and to ask them questions and to find out how they did things. He believed in me. He believed in me enough not to discourage me from, from doing what I wanted to do. You know what else he did? And he used to drag me around to do little speaking engagements for him. You know how they always ask you guys to kind of talk about blindness, you know, to some lines <laughs> group or this group or that group or whatever, and get little presentations to fill in their program time. Okay, well, <clears throat> instead of just, you know, the professionals going, they used to drag some of us students to go. Okay. And so I'd get up there and I'd talk about how I was going to do stuff with a blind person and how, you know, I like this program. And, you know, and so I was. One day, I was a college student, and I was at one of these um, talks. And after I got done, a man in the audience came up and offered me a job that summer, working to work with blind people at a school from um, a big institution for folks with, with um, mental retardation. Okay, and he um, offered me a job, and that was my first summer job. And I thought, whoa, I guess maybe it helps to get out there and to network mm -hmm. and to find things. And maybe that's one of the first clues for people to find jobs. Okay, so then I went back to college and it was, I was in my last semester and it was time to student teach. And the dean of the college pulled me in and this still happens, you guys, mm -hmm. pulled me in to his office and said, Joanne, we're not going to let you student teach. And I said, why? I've gotten great grades. I've done all the course requirements. Why not? And in those days, he said it straight up. He said, because you're blind. Okay? And I said, wait a minute. You know, by then I developed enough advocacy skills that I knew what he was saying was right, but I didn't know quite how to fight him. So I went back to you know who, my <laughs> rehab agency, my counselor, the head of the rehab agency, I didn't kind of it. And I went to these guys and I said, oh no, all this, and they're not gonna let me. And if I don't student teach, I'm not gonna be able to get my teaching credential, and I won't be able to be a teacher. And so they went in and helped me advocate. They helped me find a, a student teaching placement that would accept me. And it was one in one of the model programs in our state. And Iowa State, the first I was going to, um, had been trying to get student teachers into that program for ages and had not been able to. Well, my rehab agency opened the doors for Iowa State. And they sent me that semester, but they also sent three sighted student teachers. And to this day, they're still sending student teachers to that system to student teach in. So the agency believed in me enough to help me fight the, the battles, you know, not just throw a little money and a little training at me and even pay my college tuition. They believed in me and helped me actually fight that. Okay, so then I graduated and I was out interviewing. And yeah, sure, I had an interview probably 10 times more places than my sighted counterpart, but eventually I got a job right there where Iowa State University was, right there in that public school system. And I got my first teaching job. And I was all puffed up. I'm going, ha, ah, yeah, did that on my own. My rehab counselor wasn't even there. I did all that on my own. Yeah, like fun, I did it on my own, okay? 
without the rehab professionals believing in me, okay, helping me provide with me training, paying for my college, paying for my master's degree. You know, they've sunk a lot of time and a lot of money into me. And you guys do that with your consumers too. Come on, sometimes you have people in their, your caseloads for years, okay? And you're sinking lots of dollars into it. And you're thinking, what the heck? What, you know, come on, you know, this is a big investment. You know, and services for the blind and deaf get a lot of criticism for that out there in the world. You know, you guys are high cost cases, it take time. Okay, so the agency did that for me. They put in a lot of dollars and a lot of time. It wasn't a quick, easy, fast play placement like the Power of Labor wants us to do now. Fast, easy, quick, cheap placements. No, it took time. But once I was finished and they closed my case, just think of the thousands and thousands of taxes I have paid back into the system. I haven't drawn down welfare payments. I haven't been a ward of the state. You know, I, I've paid back taxes far more than was ever invested in me. So the work you do is important. You know, my counselor had a belief system. He had a belief system and he believed in me. And then he helped me begin to believe in myself. He was on my side. He did extra things like he introduced me to other blind people. A major thing. He gave me mentors. So it wasn't just a bunch of talk or fancy brochures. I could look and see that it was real. He helped me get the skills and the attitudes that I needed. He went the extra mile. Okay. When you guys were talking about, you know, you want to give back, you want to make stuff different for people, you want to you know, make a difference out there in the world. Okay, it, it is an easy job to do that. Sometimes it means going the extra mile. I'll tell you a little story. Um, I was RSA commissioner at one point, and we used to have these um, weekly meetings with the Secretary of Education, you know, at the national level. Okay, and so one day we were in this little meeting, there's about 20 of us, and the Secretary of Education came in he said, I want to tell you guys something. He said, I just came back from a funeral. And he said, at that funeral, the minister got up and he told us the date that John Smith, the deceased, was born. And he said, and then he said, there's a little dash. And he said, and then he told us the day he passed away. And he said, you know, there's not a lot that we could do about the day we're born, we have no control over that. And most we have no control over the day we die. But what we have control of, you guys, is that little dash in between. That's our life. And so the things that you do with that little dash are very important. And it's gonna make the difference as to whether you're happy, whether you're successful, whether you get when you get to be an old person like me and I'm old and retired now and old has been and it is so wonderful to be able to look back and see that something was done with that dash that I wasn't just working and putting you know just doing the job doing what I have to do collecting the paycheck that that dash was really used for something and that's when you guys said in your introductions many of you said you want to make a difference, you want to do something, you want to help people, you want to give people hope, you know, you want to get people out of desperation, okay? You guys are the luckiest profession ever, ever, because you have the opportunity to do that. If you're just on a factory line somewhere, you know, I, I saw a lady at breakfast this morning, and she was, you know, going working for the post office. She was here doing training for the post office. And I thought, yeah, yeah, I guess that's important, but, but what you guys are doing is really important. I mean, really important. You could look at your dash and say you really did do something significant. I mean, it is a cause that you have the wonderful opportunity to give to other people and to change people's lives and to make a real difference for them. So I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here because without you and without this whole team and all of you doing stuff, 
we wouldn't be able to build a great agency here in, in Alabama. And you wouldn't have the opportunity to make your dash count for something. Okay, and I want to remind you, you know, because sometimes we get mundane and we're just worried about the main things. And people don't stop and tell you that you're doing something important. I'm going to tell you you're doing something important, and we're going to keep doing something important. And we're going to do the best job we can and build the best house we can. Now, let me see if you guys have some questions before I get into my next little topic. Or comments, questions, comments? Joanne, this is Carol. Uh, uh, wait, wait. I'm just wondering how long did your blindness train take? Nine months. I probably could have been there longer. Sometimes I wish I would have been. I was like, you know, so if I had to go back to college. I had to go back in the mainstream again. I wish I would have taken more time, but it took me nine months. You know, lots of times students at LCB, when I say, how long is your training? They say, how long will I be? I say, oh, six to nine months, maybe even a year. And they go, well, I can't take that much time out of our life. That's going to be one of the questions that a lot of people are going to ask you that. You know, and I say to them, listen, it is the best investment of time that you will ever make is to take that training and to build the firm foundation you know build it so it's strong so that everything you build on that then will be solid it'll be okay you build just a flippy floppy little quick easy kind of half-baked little foundation you're always going to be a little shaky through life you know and things aren't going to go as smoothly so take the time like you do with your own children you know, take the time Build a firm foundation for better problems later. And so I personally advocate if it's a good training program to take the time and <coughs> convince people that it's the best use of the time that they'll ever have. Joanne. Uh huh. This is Joey Ritchie. I have a, I have a question. You, you mentioned your own, you know, that, that day when you came home and there was the uh, commission for the blind in front of your house and yeah. you walked around the block. Yeah. And what do you do when you have, especially a high school student who's, for better or worse, still walking around the block? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay, and that's what the next segment is going to get into a little bit. Okay, um, I used to do the last ten years. I was doing seminars for blind college students a lot, and and, and blind high school kids. Oh God, we'd have forty high blind high school kids, you know, for a weekend. It was wild. Okay. And we talked about that very issue. That is an excellent <clears throat> question and so pertinent. And it's not just high school kids, okay? It's adults too, you know? Come on, we all fight being blind, you know? It's an attitudinal thing, okay? And I'm going to give you some solutions to that in a minute. I can ramble on a little bit, but there really are some solutions. They're not easy. And sometimes people will never listen to you and never accept what, you have, what you're showing them. Okay, that happens occasionally, but 90% of them do. Okay, so I'm going to give you some answers on how to deal with that with all of our, our consumers because it's the major, one of the major problems that we have. And it's not just a technique, it's a whole attitude change that you've got to work with people on. Good question. I, I get, we'll get into that the rest of the day. But yeah, that's a whole, the rest of the day is going to be devoted to that question. Okay, <laughs> one way or another. Anybody else have questions? Comments? Okay, now you guys, I'm gonna we're gonna listen to this old-fashioned cassette tape. Um, and you want to see the antique? Uh, young people even know what they are. Okay, um, okay. Now we're gonna listen to a story. Okay, and it's a little bit hard to listen to. Okay, um, it, to follow at first. So you gotta pay attention. You can't miss a line here or there. Or maybe in the first three minutes, or you're gonna get lost. Okay. All right, so pay attention. It's short, and I think you're gonna you're gonna like it. And you're gonna see some relevance to the story. Okay, the story was actually written by a guy named McKinley Cantor. And McKinley Cantor actually grew up in the town of Webster City, Iowa, where I grew up in. Okay, years before. It's an old story. Just before I was around there, but I just kind of always liked it because. He wrote this story and then in the town that I grew up in, and he's kind of a famous little author in our little area, which you guys have probably never heard of him. But, um, but I think it's got a point, and we're going to use it as our next little point thing. So let's listen carefully and see what you think. A 
A Man Who Had No Eyes by McKinley Cantor. A beggar was coming down the avenue just as Mr. Parsons emerged from his hotel. He was a blind beggar, carrying the traditional battered cane and thumping his way before him with a cautious, half furtive effort of the sightless. He was a shaggy, thick-necked fellow. His coat was greasy about the lapels and pockets, and his hands flayed over the cane's crook with a futile sort of clinging. He wore a black pouch slung over his shoulder. Apparently, he had something to sell. The air was rich with spring. Sun was warm and yellowed on the asphalt. Mr. Parsons, standing there in front of his hotel and noting the clack-clack approach of the sightless man, felt a sudden and foolish sort of pity for all blind creatures. And, thought Mr. Parsons, he was very glad to be alive. A few years ago, he had been little more than a skilled laborer. Now he was successful, respected, admired, insurance. And he had done it alone, unaided, struggling beneath handicap. And he was still young. The blue air of spring, fresh from its memories of windy pools and lush shrubbery, could thrill him with eagerness. He took a step forward just as the tap-tapping blind man passed him by. Suddenly, the shabby fellow turned. Listen, Governor, just a minute of your time. Mr. Parsons said, it's late. I have an appointment. Do you want me to give you something? I ain't no beggar, Governor. You bet I ain't. I got a handy little article here. He fumbled until he could press a small object into Mr. Parsons' hand. That I sell. One buck. <laughs> Best cigarette lighter made. Mr. Parsons stood there somewhat annoyed and embarrassed. He was a handsome figure with his immaculate gray suit and gray hat and malacca stick. <clears throat> of course, the man with the cigarette lighters could not see him. But I don't smoke, he said. Listen, I bet you know plenty of people who smoke. Nice little present, wheedled the man. And mister, you wouldn't mind helping a poor guy out? He clung to Mr. Parsons' sleeve. Mr. Parsons sighed and felt in his vest pocket. He brought out two half dollars and pressed them into the man's hand. Certainly, I'll help you out. As you say, I can give it to someone. Maybe the elevator boy would. He hesitated, not wishing to be boorish and inquisitive, even with a blind peddler. Have you lost your sight entirely? The shabby man pocketed the two half dollars. Fourteen years, Governor. Then he added with an insane sort of pride. Westbury, sir. I was one of them. Westbury, repeated Mr. Parsons. Ah, yes. The chemical explosion. The papers haven't mentioned it for years. But at the same time, it was supposed to be one of the greatest disasters in... They've all forgot about it. The fellow shifted his feet wearily. I tell you, Governor, the man who was in it, don't forget about it. Last thing I ever saw was sea shot going up in one grand smudge and gas pouring in all of the best busted windows. Mr. Parsons coughed, but the blind peddler was caught up with the train of his one dramatic reminiscence. And also, he was thinking that there might be more half dollars in Mr. Parsons' pocket. Just think about it, Governor. There was 108 people killed, about 200 injured, and over 50 of them lost their eyes, blind as bats. He groped forward with his dirty hand rested against Mr. Parsons' coat. I tell you, sir, there wasn't nothing worse than that in the war. If I had lost my eyes in the war, okay, I would have been well took care of. But I was just a workman, working for what was in it. And I got it. You're darn right, I got it. While the capitalists were making their dough, they was insured. Don't worry about that. They insured, repeated his listener. Yes, that's what I sell. You want to know how I lost my eyes, cried the man. Well, here it is. His words fell with the bitter and studied drama of a story often told and told for money. I was there in Seashaw, last of all the folks rushing out. Out in the air there was a chance. 
even with buildings exploding right and left. A lot of guys made it safe out the door and got away. And just when I was about there, crawling along between those big vats, a guy behind me grabs my leg. He says, let me pass. You, maybe he was nuts, I don't know. I try to forgive him in my heart, governor. But he was bigger than me. He hauled me back and climbs right over me, tramples me into the dirt, and he gets out. And I lie there with all that poison gas pouring down on all sides of me and flame and stuff. He swallowed a studied sob and stood dumbly expectant. He could imagine the next words. Tough luck, my man. Now I want to. That's the story, Governor. The spring wind shrilled past them, damp and quivering. Not quite said Mr. Parsons. The blind peddler shivered crazily. Not quite. What do you mean, you? That story is true, Mr. Parsons said, except that it was the other way around. The other way around? He croaked uneasily. Say, governor. I was in sea, I was in sea shop, said Mr. Parsons. It was the other way around. You were the fellow who hauled back on me and climbed over me. You were bigger than I was, Mark Ward. The blind man stood for a long time, swallowing hoarsely. He gulped. Parsons. I thought you... And then he screamed fiendishly. Yes, maybe so, maybe so. But I'm blind, I'm blind. And you've been standing here letting me spout to you and laughing at me every minute of it. I'm blind. People in the street turned to stare at him. You got away, but I'm blind. Do you hear? I'm... Well, said Mr. Parsons, don't make such a row about it, Mark Ford. So am I. Okay, so you guys, what do you think? We got two men, Mark Hort, the blind beggar, and Parsons, the successful insurance man. Both blinded in the same accident. One became the blind beggar, and one became the successful insurance set. What do you think the difference is between these two? Will. The city. Huh? Will. Uh-huh. Anybody else? Attitude. Another Cindy, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Attitude. Okay. What else? Anybody else like a little more? This is Carol again. Uh -huh. You wonder if there were high expectations from someone else affecting the person who was successful. Uh -huh. Exactly. Maybe the different opportunities. Yeah. Anything else? The one. This is Joey again. The one thing that I that I thought about. Bottom line doesn't have anything to do with the sight. Being able to see or not to see it, it's whatever they did after the accident. Mm -hmm. And what made the difference, Joy? <coughs> I, I wouldn't see it. I think it's attitude. Somebody want to explain this attitude business to me a little more? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is Sue. It's, uh, I think, an interest in going ahead to do in spite of what the general public thinks you can do. Mm -hmm. Just going ahead doing if you've got a little encouragement and a good support system. Mm -hmm. You can do a bunch of stuff. I don't know what the blind beggar had in his background there. But, uh, probably the insurance salesman had People who believed in him, and he believed in himself. 
Well, he just went ahead and did what he needed to to make a success in his life. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is this can be again. The blind beggar also held he he was all for self too. You know, he held that man back so he could get out. That tells a lot about his attitude right there. Mm -hmm. Might have some problems before he This is Cindy. It just seems like we all have things in our life. We all experience problems, but if we want to overcome them, we can through training and discipline. It's, it's just how you look at life. You can look at it as the glass is half full or half empty. I know it's a cliche, but. Yeah, uh, this is Jeff. Mm -hmm. But if you, if, if before you go blind, you have a bad attitude or, or mm -hmm. laid attitude or whatever. Uh, you have a negative attitude before you mm -hmm. go blind. Being blind is not going to help your attitude, uh, make your attitude look better. If you had a negative outlook on life beforehand, you, you saw that, out, that outlook is only going to be worse. And so the, the beggar probably, probably would have just begged if, they, if he thought he could get away with it before he went blind. He didn't, before he went blind, he just thought about like he couldn't get away with it. You know, he, it just all depends on what type of person was he before, before he. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> this is Dennis speaking. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, in terms of that story, I mean, I'm kind of with the whole desperation thing still. Um, I feel like anybody can change regardless of what their background is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from where I'm from, I'm from one of the worst neighborhoods you can imagine. But if you just abstract away blindness, I've seen people use anything to scapegoat yeah. on it. Yeah. Um, regardless of the situation, I mean, whether they're able bodied people or not, um, in that particular circumstance, though, I think his eyes were open, so to speak, and he ran into Mr. Parsons and got that story. Um, how the rest of his life turned out would be interesting to see um, the, the beggar that is after he found out that Mr. Parsons was blind as well. Um, is what I would like to know. Anybody else? We've gotten a lot of comments from people who are blind or uh, have low vision, but all you sighted guys are so quiet. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll see. They'll, they'll, they'll loosen up when we're all done. Okay, okay. Well, it's helping people. You know, um, was it Joy that asked about the teenagers? Yes. Yeah, okay. Joy. Okay. Um, I um, play this, this tape for a lot of our teenage groups. Okay. And they come up with the same things you guys just talked about. Okay. Um, to some degree. And, um, one thing is I always say to them, and this is a technique you could use with them, is play something. I always tell them, listen, you guys, you have a choice. You can become the blind beggar or you can become the successful businessman. You have a choice. You can be the weird old blind person or you can be the normal blind person. Which one do you want to be? The weird guy or the normal guy? Well, they all answer normal. Course, you know, <laughs> they're gonna be the weird. I say, so it's up to you. You have a choice. You know, and now is the time to confront it and to decide it and to make it happen for you. You know, and we and this rehab agency will give you some tools and give you some opportunities so that you can become a normal person, not a weird person. But you can just as easily become the weird blind guy. You know, it's up to you whether you take on some of these things we have to offer you or you don't okay so there's one technique for you over there okay now um i'm going to talk just for a minute you know one of the difference i think cindy first set up and several of the rest of you guys said it is their attitude okay these two guys have a total different viewpoint or different philosophy different set of beliefs 
about blindness. Okay, so one of the things you can do with your teenagers, with your clients, with the new Structured Discovery Center, with anything that you work in in this field, that I think is extremely important, to take a note, but we'll start by this, okay? Because I believe that we need to help, like my Don Bell did for me, is we need to have people, help people develop their own personal defined philosophy about blindness. We need to help our consumers, not just by giving them a college tuition or helping them buy a computer or sending them off for some training somewhere or whatever, okay? You know, we don't need to be just a bank that's banking, you know, giving them the money for these kind of services. We also have an obligation to help them start beginning to develop their own defined philosophy about blindness. Because with that philosophy, if they have a philosophy, it's gonna, they'll have one anyway, even if they can't define it. You know, they'll have one, it might be anything goes or whatever, you know? But we need to help them define it because that's gonna help them determine the actions. Their set of beliefs will determine what they're gonna do with their life. You know, just like we have definite political views, we have definite religious views, we also need to have definite views about disability, about our blindness or deafness. Okay, and if the family members, the people around us don't have those beliefs, if they do, better. And if they don't, we ourselves, as people with disabilities, need to develop our own personal defined philosophy. Now I say personal, defined philosophy, because not everybody's set of beliefs are the same. I'm not gonna sit here and shove down your throat and say, this is what I believe, and this is what you know, NFP believes, or this is what the NACB believes, or whatever. I'm not gonna tell you that, okay? Because at different times, and different places, and different ages in people's lives, their philosophy about blindness changes, and it's okay. You know, is there anything right or wrong? I don't know. But I'm going to tell you just for a minute what I personally believe. But what my personal defined philosophy is at this point in my life. It always hasn't been this necessarily. And it varies and it's changed at times. Okay. But just to give you a sample of what the heck I'm talking about, I'm going to tell you what my personal defined philosophy about blindness is. Okay. You can say, I don't agree with that. I agree with that. I don't agree with that. That's fine. You know, like I said, there's no right or wrong. But it's important for a person to have a core set of beliefs and joy that's what our teenagers are missing okay is that they haven't figured out what their nobody's explored with them what their philosophy about blindness is okay what they believe and what they don't believe. i haven't given them the chance to think differently than whether where, where they're thinking now and so it's not an easy thing belief is an easy thing to get teenagers to think differently sometimes but we expose them to it, and then we see what they'll take, what they won't take. Okay, number one, my personal philosophy is, is that I believe that it is respectable to be blind. I think this is a core, core belief with me and lots of blind people that have been successful. Okay, that it's respectable to be blind. Now, how does that, you know, make sense? I and mean, how does that get down to real life? Well. You know, using a white cane. I fought it. I was not going to be seen with that darn white cane. I mean, <coughs> my God, everybody would know I was blind. I would stick out a crowd. People would treat me funny. My friends are thinking, what happened to you, Joanne? Why are you suddenly blind? You know, and, and so it was not respectable for me to carry a white cane because inside I was ashamed about blindness. I felt that it was the weirdo person that was blind and not the normal person. And God, what teenager or what person wants to be associated with the, the weirdos that you know look funny and act funny and don't work and are dependent on people and the people with pity and you know, who wants to be that? Okay? And the cane was a symbol of that. So that's why, you guys, a lot of your young people or other people fight that cane. I fought it. I used to, they gave it to me and I'd use it in training, then I'd go home and I'd hide it somewhere. I'd hide it at the bus station, take the bus home and come back and get it. You know, I'd play the game of hiding it, of you know, trying to pretend it wasn't there. That's why in structured discovery during the training period, 
um, we always insisted on people using the straight, not folding cane, mm -hmm. because we knew they would fold it until they got their attitude straightened out and hide it somewhere. Later when they left, fine, if it's convenient, whatever, you know. But but during training, no, I use a folding cane right now, okay, because it's convenient in travel. But during training, no way, because my attitudes weren't shaped up yet. You know, I would have hid that thing constantly, you know. <laughs> it was not respectable to be blind, okay. Braille, you know, um, sorry, Jeff, but, you know, I bought Braille. I don't want Braille. I mean, that really is a blind thing, you know, <laughs> not respectable. But then it was a little bit easier because you could kind of hide it. It wasn't quite the same as, you know, marching around in front of old friends with a cane, you know. Braille, you could kind of hide and just kind of sneak out a little bit. But it was still, it felt funny at first using Braille because I didn't see it was respectable. Okay. Using the word blind. I mean, come on, you guys. The whole world. I mean, the whole world talks about at least, you know, visually impaired and visually whatever, included and, you know, partially sighted. And I don't know. You know, all, you know all the millions of terms that people use visually impaired and all that kind of stuff. Okay. You know, they're, they're okay words, you know. But for me, now, this is my belief, okay? It doesn't have to be yours. And you can disagree with me. And most people do. Okay. But I. I, I just figure once I saw it was respectable to be blind, I wasn't afraid to use the big B word. You know, mm -hmm. I could use it because my feelings about seeing blindness as respectable was okay. I wasn't embarrassed about that word anymore. You just use it straight up and call, you know, Martin Luther King taught us, you know, um, black is black, be proud of being black. Don't, don't sit and cover it up by using all these other words and pretending, you know, we're not what we are. And just be proud of what we are, you know, and most minorities are that way, you know, most minorities go through a thing where they say, okay, we're going to be called this and we're proud of it, you know, and blind people are emerging minorities, we're blind, you know, we're a minority too, and so to me, using the word, it took me a long time, I used to choke on it, <laughs> use other yeah. words and, you know, whatever, I mean, it took me a long time, but like I said, there were phrases in my life when I didn't see it as very respectable, so I wasn't going to use a cane to braille or use the word blind, okay? Um, hanging around other blind people, you know? Come on, I walked around the block for Pete's sakes. You know, I felt embarrassed being drugged to this group of blind college students. I didn't want to be around blind people because I did not see it as respectable to be blind, okay? All right, so those are some of the ways that I see that we show or could be symptoms of deep down not feeling as very respectful. There's probably others. You guys can probably think of them, think of other things. But I'm just briefly going through, you know, some of my thinking on it. Okay. So one of my basic personal tenets is that I see that it's respectable to be blind. And I've seen people that accept this particular piece of philosophy being freer inside and more comfortable and you know, they give up the struggle, you know, mm -hmm. struggle to cover up and pretend and deny and, you know, ignore and, you know, whatever. Um, and you finally give up the struggle and say, okay, I'm going to look at this thing straight on. I'm going to learn the skills. I'm going to look at the attitudes. And I'm going to be blind and it's okay. The world doesn't fall apart. And I'm actually free, freer and more capable now that I embrace the fact that I'm blind and not hide it and struggle. Okay, so number one, that's mine, okay? My, my second little personal thing is that I really feel that the real problem with blindness is not the blindness itself, it's not the loss of eyesight, but rather it's the misconceptions and stereotype notions that exist about blindness within myself and with the general public. Okay, a lot there, isn't it? Okay, that the real problem isn't the loss of eyesight. It's our feelings about it and the public's feelings about it. Okay, and there's lots of crazy notions out there about blindness that we can't buy into that. Okay, why when I was growing up, you were growing up, some of the consumers that you work with, you know, when they first go blind, you know, why, why do we have these, you know, how do we get depressed and feeling desperate? And worry about being pitied and feeling sad and all that kind of stuff because we start soaking up the attitudes 
about of the people around us about blindness. Okay, the real problem wasn't the loss of eyesight when I was three years old. I could handle that. The real problem was the pitting and the patting and the feeling sad that my, my mother and uncle felt. Okay, it was those kind of misconceptions or those feelings about blindness that I absorbed and then I fought being blind. Joey, you're teenagers again. Okay, they're fighting being blind, they don't want the stuff you're offered. They don't want to use the techniques. They don't want to use it because they're, they've absorbed the misconceptions and the crazy attitudes that the world has about blindness. Okay? And so for me, it helped to really look at what the public thinks about blindness, to analyze it. That's why your structured discovery thing, but I'll start by this, you absolutely need to have Discussion classes, whatever you want to call them, we used to call them seminar classes at the Louisiana Center, you can call them whatever the heck you want. But discussions where you talk about the students' feelings and attitudes and philosophy and belief about blindness, because you need to spend time with them developing their own defined philosophy about blindness. Okay? And you need to pull out with your consumers, whether they're in your office, program, whatever what they really believe about blindness, okay, and help them throw away the crappy stuff that's not even true, okay, help them throw away the negative stuff that old uh, Mark or the beggar had, and throw away those attitudes, and put in some healthier new views of blindness, okay, the real problem is the misconceptions, the misunderstandings that we have ourselves that have to be thrown out, okay, and, and where do we get them? We get them from the public mostly they think we're we can't do too much okay <coughs> it's sort of pity and sadness and patting on the back it's not horrible things they think about us it's more low expectation <coughs> okay. so second first one is the respectable second one is the real problem of blindness is the misconceptions and stereotype notions that exist within ourselves and with the public now that's again another part of my personal philosophy i share this with you because Took me years to um, <laughs> understand and think about this, so I'm going to try and shorten this up a little bit for you. Okay, um, you know you hear this about in the, the you know organizations. There's other blind people that talk about this. You know this isn't anything new and revolutionary with me. There's lots of literature written about these concepts. I'm just summarizing it for you. Okay, third one. Bong, bong, bong. Okay, that <clears throat> that I personally see blindness as a characteristic. Not a terrible hand, handicap, not a terrible handicap, okay? That is, it's just a physical nuisance, not a terrible tragedy. You know, old Marquardt saw it as a tragedy. You know, he saw it as a real handicap, and it became a handicap for him because he saw it. You know, Parsons, you know, our insurance salesman, saw blindness as a characteristic or just a physical nuisance. And sometimes that physical nuisance is a big pain in the behind. I mean, sometimes it gets so frustrating when you want to just read something you can't right there. Or transportation is my big headache. It's so darn irritating with transportation. But it's a nuisance. It's not a tragedy. You know? And that's a big difference. Everybody has a sighted blind. Everybody has nuisances in their life. For Pete's sake, we don't have enough money. We, you know, not as intelligent as we want. We're not as good looking as we want. We're not good dancers. Whatever. You know, we all have nuisances in our life. Okay? Um, but it depends on the way we look at it, whether it's a tragedy mm -hmm. or just an inconvenience mm -hmm. or characteristic. And the big thing, Joy, what I do with the teenagers is I tell them you've got a choice, okay? And, and with our consumers, if you could say, okay, you guys, you have a choice and you're the only one that can do this. You can choose to see blindness as a horrible tragedy, or you can see it as a characteristic of nuisance. Okay? And you have to make that choice. And whatever choice you make is going to determine how you view blindness, whether you're going to become a blind beggar or the Parsons. Okay? And you're the only one that has, you know, can do that. And, and point to them that it's now the time to make that choice. Now, let me tell you a story. Okay? I have a brother. He's three years younger than I am, and he's blind. Okay, we both had RP. You know, the only ones in our family that had it, but my lucky parents popped up with two blind kids. Okay? All right. 
My brother went through the same structured discovery training I went through, had the same exposure to wonderful blind mentors, okay, had the same opportunity to go off to consumer organizations, in this case the NFB, for you know, conventions and all that to get all pumped up and read the same material I was reading. He had a great counselor too, you guys. You know, rehab counselor, the agency was good job. They invested in him. They sent him to college. He got a master's degree. You know, he got a, a, his first job. Okay. That sounds good, doesn't it? Okay. But then my brother, on his first job, started losing more vision. Okay. And he wouldn't use his cane. Mm -hmm. He was still embarrassed about it. He wouldn't switch over and use blindness techniques, even though he had them and neither were available because he was a little embarrassed about it all and just didn't feel comfortable. And, you know, he was in the PR business for Pete's sake. You don't need sight to think up jingles and commercials and stuff like that. You know, it was a job he absolutely could have done, just switching over and using a few techniques. He wasn't driving trucks or anything, you know? Okay, but he refused to do this. So my brother, for the last... Um, Six now, um, for the last, I don't know, 30 years or so, maybe longer, mm has -hmm. been sitting in an apartment in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, doing absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. He never got married, you know, no family, um, never worked another job again. My brother will not leave his house for weeks at a time, weeks at a time. He has a lady that he hires that goes, she goes and gets his groceries and does his errands for him. But he literally will not leave his house. Okay, I invite him to stop, I offer to take him to conventions, I offer him to take him on trips, I'll go to my house. He just won't leave. He's just become this hermit. He has let blindness become a tragedy for him. He has become Worse than Marco, at least Marco was out there doing something, you know? Okay? I mean, he, he, he's just let the light is destroy him. And he had all the things that we talk about, you guys. You know, our opportunity, I often think about this, and I think, why can't I go around preaching this stuff? I've trained how many people? We've had thousands of people going to the center. And my own brother, my own brother is sitting there, okay? And, you know, I've tried. But the problem is that he's made his choice. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. made his choice. And so I want to tell you this because you are going to have failure. What you think of as failures working in this rehab world, okay? You're going to have the consumer that you're working with, your rehab counselor people, or your, you know, the deputy, whatever, or people at this, this new fancy structured discovery center. You know, you're going to want to get everybody up to this perfect 10, you know, the big success story. Some of them won't do it. Okay, you know, you're going to start out with them at maybe a one or a two on the scale of one to ten, trying to get them up to that perfect ten. Okay, and they may level off at a three or a five or a six or a seven, <clears throat> and they may not make the perfect ten. Okay, but you have, what you are doing is giving people an opportunity. Okay, you're showing them the truth, you're giving them resources, and giving them opportunities. But after that, it is up to them to make their choice. Okay? And so they may choose to only get to a certain level towards your perfect 10. That's okay. You know, they made their choice. We did our job. We gave them the opportunity. Now, a lot will get up to that top. So I don't want to discourage you. You know, if we do our job right, we'll have our hope successes. But even if we move them from a two to a four, that's a success. You know, we've made their life a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Maybe not in our minds as good as we want it to be, but they choose where they want to stop, you guys. Where they want to stop. And they have a right to do that. So I tell you, okay, um, in my personal philosophy then, is that I have chosen to believe that blindness is just a characteristic, it's just a physical nuisance and not a terrible handicap or a terrible tragedy, okay? So that is my third part of my personal <laughs> philosophy about blindness, okay? All right, long, 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 here comes the fourth one, okay? My fourth personal thing that I've adopted, it's taken me a while to figure it out, okay, <clears throat> is that with the proper training and opportunity, a blind person can do 
what they would do if they were sighted. You know, that's a big one, you guys. You know, we're really saying that blind guys can lead normal lives, that blind people can do the job equal to their sighted counterpart, you know, based on their other abilities. You know, if you're, you know, a genius, you do what geniuses are doing. If you're not so genius, then you do it, you know, your sighted counterparts to do it, okay? You know, just because you're blind, you don't develop all these other extra techniques, you know, or just you know, great gifts or whatever, you know? You do what you're doing if you're sighted. Okay, all right, uh, you know, based on your other abilities. All right, so, but the big thing is with the proper mm -hmm. training and opportunity. That's why I'm so glad you guys are here. You're, you're doing this structure, you're doing this structure discovery, and because you're going to get some, some additional proper opportunities and proper training here in Alabama. Okay, because we need to have the proper training. And the opportunities, your job plays with people and all your VF counselors and stuff. Opportunities, blah, blah, that's your job. Okay. Um, you know, in order to move people up the scale. Okay. Now, with these proper trainings and opportunities, okay, um, you use alternative techniques. And that's why Jeff, the Braille teacher, I'm so glad you're here. The O&M instructors, I'm so glad you're here. The computer people, I'm so glad you're here. The technology people. Okay. You know, we can talk a big line that blind people can do anything, but they really, we really can't do everything if we don't have the skills. Okay, and that's why the stuff you do, you know, providing the skills. We can't just automatically say, "Oh yeah, yeah, you can do anything you want." I hate it when they say blind people can do anything they want because that's not true. You can't do it unless you've got the techniques and you've got the abilities and the other gifts and the intelligence and all that kind of stuff. You know, come on, we're not just magic. Just saying that stuff doesn't just make this magic stuff happen. It's a lot of nitty gritty. And I want to tell you, when I was working with students, I had these students that used to come into our center, and they would just sort of sit there and hope that by osmosis, <laughs> they would become these perfect human beings, you know, just by being there. And they'd never, you know, practice their braille or use their, practice their cane or do anything. You know, they never tried to cook anything when they went back to their apartments or anything. I thought, come on, get off it. You are not getting this by osmosis. You have got to put in hard work, at, just like you did going to high school or college or anything else, technical school. You've got to work at something, you know, and you've got to develop these techniques or it's not going to ever be true for you. Okay, now, <clears throat> I'll tell you one other story that deeply affected me when I was in training in, my, in the first structure discovery one in Iowa. Okay, the guy named Dr. Jernigan, Kenneth Jernigan, was the director of that whole agency. And he lived in the building that our students were housed in and you know, all the programs were in and stuff. Um, Alan Harris used to live in that apartment when he ran that program. Okay, and so Dr. Jernigan used to have all these important state legislators and stuff um, to his apartment for dinner. And he would often ask us students to come up there and help you know, serve the meal and hang around and educate these important state legislators about blindness, okay? And to kind of show off what we were really doing in this first structure discovery training program, okay? <clears throat> so I was up there one night for um, this these dinners, myself and several other students, and the meal was over and I was hanging out in the kitchen, trying to get out of work, just hanging there, and um, somebody came up to me and said, Joanne, would you go refill the coffee cups of the state legislators. And I said, um, no, why don't you let Marge over there go do it? Um, she has a little bit more eyesight than I do. <laughs> and so Marge took the coffee pot and she went and refilled the coffee cups. And I thought, shoosh, out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, the next morning, <clears throat> I got to call to Dr. Jernigan's office. And believe me, he was a very, um, you didn't want to be called to his office, you know, and you did not, you know. And so I thought, oh, crap, what did I do? Okay, so I went trotting in there, and he sat me down, and he said, Joanne, he said, what do you want to do when you leave this training program? And I said, oh, I'm going to go back to college, and I'm going to become a teacher, and I'm going to get married, and I'm going to have kids. Yeah. And he says, Joanne, you really believe you're going to do all that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do all that. You know, I have many of the words to say now, and I was beginning to even believe him some, you know? <laughs> okay? And and he said to me, he said, but Joanne, last night you wouldn't fill the coffee cups. And I said, uh, 
Pennsylvania. Oh, what difference does that make? I mean, Marge did it. And he said, Joanne, he said, I want to tell you something. And I've remembered this for 50 years now, you guys. He said, Joanne, if you start saying no to the fill in the coffee cup, Pretty soon you'll start saying no to cooking a meal, crossing a busy street, going to the grocery store yourself, doing your laundry. He said, Joanne, life is made up of a series of little things. And if you start saying no to the little things and not doing them because of your blindness, he said, pretty soon the days will pass, the weeks will pass, the months will pass, and in my brother's case, the years will pass. And you'll never achieve those big things. You'll never get them if you start saying no to filling the coffee cups. And I remembered that story. And it kind of guided my life. And sometimes I've had to push myself to get over the fear that exists about doing new things as a blind person. But you sighted people, it's the same with you. You know, you have fears, and sometimes you let that hold you back too. And you'll see it holding back our, our consumers. They're, they're scared, you know. But if they're given proper training and proper opportunities, which is what rehab is all about, then they can have the opportunity to do something else. Okay. Last piece of my philosophy, then we're going to take a break, so all you people have to go to the bathroom. I'm almost done. Okay. All right. Last piece of my personal philosophy, or at least that I'm going to talk about today, is that if you want equal rights as a blind person, you need to take on equal responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. This is a tough one, you guys. I have more arguments about this and more fights about this. Mm -hmm. And when I do trainings, I bring this up. I mean, a few years ago, I we went to Poland and did some training, and I brought up this particular philosophy thing. I thought I was going to get strung out and thrown out. <laughs> they did not want to give up their free bus passes. And they, you know, in Poland, as a blind person, you only have to work six hours, or everybody else works eight hours, and then a, a day, and you know, you get all these free passes to everything, and you get and some housing and all kinds of opportunities, uh, not opportunities, but <clears throat> privileges. And you'd say, if you want equal rights, if you want to be seen as an equal, then maybe you need to give up uh, equal, take on equal responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm going to leave you with that little bit of philosophy. These are my personal defined ones. Maybe things you want to pass on to other people, mm -hmm. take on yourself, mm -hmm. and it may not be. And there's experiences in all of these, you guys. There's various, and after we take our break, I'm going to um, play a little game with you, and we're going to see, you know, what all our personal defined philosophies are about life. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh,
about my personal defined philosophy about blindness and I challenge you to start developing your own personal defined philosophy about blindness and this is very important um, that there be a philosophical um, oneness I guess in any program or maybe not oneness but at least a, a, it's very important in a structure discovery program to have Define philosophies among the staff and to have the staff encourage students to get their personal philosophies about blindness developed. Okay, that's why I went through all that because it's really important. Okay, now I'm going to ask you guys some scenarios. Okay, and I'm going to have you move either to the to my left, up the left side of the room over there where Joey and I don't want to say Cindy. Who else is over there on the left side? Either either that side of the room or over here to where. Cindy Jones and Melissa and all these guys are on the right side of the room. Okay? All right. It'll be my you guys can move too. It'll be my I'm just indicating the, the size of the room. Okay? Um, but they all move too. They can move to what, what they would do. Okay. <laughs> would you ever let a totally blind beautician cut your hair? And this is very for a very important job interview you're going to. Would you allow a totally blind beautician to cut your hair? There's no right or wrong to this answer. It's just what you personally would do. If you would go over to my left, oh, over there where Joey and those guys were. Can we ask if a you question? Would not no. If you would, <laughs> if you would not go over to my right, where Melissa and all those guys are sitting down. Okay, so if you would allow, a, you know, go to a totally blind beautician, cut your hair for a job interview for her. <laughs> my left, yes. Go to my right if you would not. Stay okay. right. Let's have everybody move. Stay Nobody right can just sit there. You can't stand neutral again inside. 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 Okay, who's over here on my left? Yeses. Margaret, who's over here? Okay. Joey. Okay. 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 okay, so I want to hear from some of you. Who, who is willing to say why they would do it? I'd like to hear from three of you as to why you do it. Cutting what? hair can kind of be a tactile type activity. You don't necessarily have to be able to see it because you can get the understanding just by seeing Okay, who else? Well, you had a great you had great intentions, but you made one mistake. You didn't tell me what what time frame I had, so I'm gonna go at seven o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and if I don't like, I can go to. It. <laughs> 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 he took it <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're, still, you're still over there on the yes side. That's right. Any I figured, you know, hair grows back. 
<laughs> what is her job interview? I've trimmed my own son's hair. Mm -hmm. So I know he turned out, his hair turned out fine. He was happy with it. And I'm not even trained, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I let, my, I let my girlfriends do it in college. We used to cut each other's hair all the time, and none of us had any experience. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty experimental. I'd be okay with it. Okay. Yeah. I would worry about styling. I, would, I will say that. I'm okay with cutting. I'd be, I would worry about styling. This is Sarah. I have, there's some sighted people I wouldn't let cut my hair. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm not a totally blind person. Yes. All right. Now let's hear from the honest souls over here, the no. Okay. Okay. Let's hear it was over here and let's see. Cindy Jones. Cindy Jones. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, there's only, it, it doesn't matter if they're blind or sighted. I'll only let one person cut my hair anyway. And tell them how much you pay for that hair. Yeah. yeah. But I will say this, Joanne, the guy who owns the salon where I go to get my hair cut is blind. So, <laughs> but I'm pretty picky about it. But you wouldn't let him cut your hair. Uh, no. <laughs> 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 no. I just don't want anybody. It, it, that's a very personal choice. It's not that they're blind or not blind. It's that I have one person I trust, and that's the only person I go to. I don't go to anybody, sighted mm -hmm. or blind. That different. Okay. Mm -hmm. Who else is over here? All right, this is Ennis speaking, okay. uh, and I have a miniature pro. So, you know how it goes with that. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't think a totally blind person could cut it? Not a pro, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so does my queen, and as you've seen this <laughs> Okay, who else? Queen B. Okay. Um, I'm Wendy. Uh huh. Yep, and I typically do, you know, just write back and forth with the person with what I want, and I can be very picky about who cuts my hair. No, not just anyone can do it, but I typically have to write back and forth for communication with that person, and mm -hmm. I'm willing to give it a try, but, you know, yeah, if, you know, communication, if I can't communicate with that person, if that person gets trained, so we can communicate, communicate is a different Okay, <coughs> all right, another interesting aspect. Okay, anybody else over here? Who knows? I'm extremely vain, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. I feel so bad sitting over here, but this is where I am. <laughs> you see, you this is Jessica. I, I use this thing because hair is a big deal. Most people. Okay. So, I'm going to go to my second scenario. Okay. All right. Would you use a blind electrician? to wire your dream house. You finally get to build the house mm -hmm. of your dreams. Would you use a blind electrician to wire that house? Mm -hmm. If you would, go to my left. If you would, go to my right. The left.